Hi, this is Larry Mantle, host of Air Talk on KPCC. Since the start of the coronavirus pandemic, we've had a daily segment on Air Talk devoted to the latest information about COVID-19. As time's gone on, we've looked at vaccines and how the virus and pandemic have affected the lives of Southern Californians. That includes doctors, nurses, epidemiologists, and other medical professionals fighting the virus on the front lines. In each episode of this podcast, we'll speak with one of our experts on the rotating panel of AirTalk guests. They'll be sharing their expertise with us daily. You can also listen anytime at las.com kpecc.org or subscribe wherever you download podcasts. Today's guest, Dr. Sam Torbati, who's co-chair of emergency medicine for Cedars-Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, um, the uh, original physician we had booked today, uh, had uh, something come up and was not able to join us. And Dr. Torbati very graciously uh, stepping in today with minimal notice. Dr. Torbati, thank you so much. We really appreciate your being with us today. Of course, we appreciate uh, talking to you and your audience always. Our great listener questions, and that's your cue to share them right now with Dr. Torbati at atcomments at kpcc.org. Please include your location and first name, or you can call us at 866-893-KPCC. Well, we have uh, from this morning uh, an analysis of COVID cases from South Africa. And that analysis, which has been done by the largest uh, private health insurer and the South African Medical Research Council shows that the Omicron variant appears to cause less severe disease than previous versions of the coronavirus, including Delta, and it appears the Pfizer vaccine offers less defense against infection, but still good protection from being hospitalized. These are preliminary, not peer-reviewed yet, but they are in line with some of the other early uh, Omicron behavior that has been anecdotally shared from from physicians and uh, medical centers treating people with the uh, Omicron variant of COVID. Uh, Dr. Torbati, what do you think of, of the findings so far? Well, so far, uh, it's, it's, it's relatively good news. Again, uh, you know, last week, we didn't have as much information about how Omicron was going to behave. And this early information coming out of South Africa makes us feel a little bit better that Although it's probably far more infectious, it's potentially less lethal. Um, I think we need to use all of this information cautiously because it's everything is preliminary, um, and the and and how this virus behaves in one population may not be the same as others. For example, in South Africa, um, you know, there's data to suggest that 80% of the population had native infection. And we don't know exactly how um, native infection and its protection uh, against severe disease with Omicron works. And so um, it's relatively good news, but we still need to be cautious because for, for folks that are not vaccinated, uh, this could still be a big issue um, if it makes its way, I should say, once it makes its way to the states and takes over as the predominant variant. Yeah. And does that seem to you to be likely at this point, given how highly transmissible uh, that this variant is, that that it will be dominant? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, we saw the same thing happen with Delta. It appeared abroad. And the next thing we know, came to the States. And because of its biological advantage, it became the dominant variant. And there's no reason to think that the exact same thing won't happen. Um, It's already reported you know, in some 3% of, of the uh, isolates in the U.S. And um, I wouldn't be surprised in the next month for it to become the dominant variant and for it to cause a lot of disease. Now, the positive would seem to be that if Omicron becomes dominant and um, Delta with its more severe symptoms are, are pushed out, could that be a net positive? Well, the problem is that... Um, for what what's probably going to happen is that Omicron is going to come in and cause a whole bunch of new infections. So although it may become dominant, they're all new infections. 
And if it wasn't for Omicron, maybe the Delta infections would slowly go away. But now we're going to see a lot new infections come through, especially with, with travel and gathering and, and people getting together, um, and especially if, if people are not vaccinated and those that are high risk, if, they're not, if they haven't had their boosters, it's going to be another round of a lot of activity. Whether that turns into a, a large number of critically ill people or hospitalizations, we don't know yet. But the hospital system's already doing predictive modeling. Ours, for example, is. And we already expect to see a lot more patients come through in the next month. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but I, I, I hear what you're saying. But I guess if you have if, if a bunch of people get sick with Omicron and have comparatively mild symptoms, yes, there might be some who would end up going to the hospital. It would seem like you you could still end up, though, with a net positive because fewer people being hospitalized than you would have had had Delta been dominant. But it sounds like you think that's that's not likely to happen. Maybe. And it's certainly, you know, as we look at the uh, uh, at the positive of this, Larry, you're absolutely correct. I mean, if Omicron was uh, a, a more virulent uh, um, virus in terms of causing more severe disease and it had the same biological advantage, that would have been a catastrophe. So you're right. There is actually some uh, positive in Omicron being less aggressive. I, I just hope that that turns out to be the case. Yeah. And I hope that what what's being experienced in South America, uh, Africa is what's seen in the rest of the world and in the States. And I certainly hope that it, this turns out to be a, a mild illness. We're talking with Dr. Sam Torbati, emergency medicine specialist at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. And I was just looked at uh, John in Glendale, your email. He asked the very same question I just asked you, Dr. Torbati. So, uh, John, thank you for that. I promise I, I didn't cannibalize your, your question. I just hadn't seen it by that time. 866-893-KPECC or email us at atcomments at kpecc.org. Please include your location with your first name. David Monrovia says, I'm an emergency room nurse. For a while, we stopped giving nebulized breathing treatments because we were unsure if the mist would spread the virus. We've now been told it's safe to start doing them again. Does Dr. Torbati have any insight into how safe nebulized breathing treatments actually are? Um, nebulized treatments uh, are still considered an aerosol generating procedure. Um, and many hospitals, including ours, have gone to using um, multi dose inhalers with spacers. And we found it to be very effective, even in treating the most critically ill as asthmatic patient. So it, it might be something to, to bring up with your medical leadership to see if they want to go that route to make things a little safer in the environment. Uh, Vicki in Monrovia says, how do you think the higher daily case rates resulting from the spread of Omicron will affect elective surgeries? Are they going to get uh, delayed again here? Vicki, uh, you know, you're, you're bringing up an incredibly important question that's on the minds of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, us in the medical leadership teams trying to decide the most that we can do for the most number of patients um, of, of those we serve. And those are the questions that are going to come up in the upcoming months. And uh, if the cases become high and hospitalization rates are high and there's no more beds, then yeah, the, the, um, the elective cases will need to stop. And um, unfortunately, depending on what you consider elective, those can have, you know, significant, you know, uh, adverse effects on patients. For example, a patient who has a, a lung tumor that's considered elective, but that tumor needs to come out, and delays could impact the patient. So it's it's a real issue yeah. as we look at capacity for hospitals to do the most for the most number of patients, and um, it's something that we're thinking about really carefully. Well, and it's also a revenue source for hospitals because I'm sure at Cedars, like other places, it's you know, so-called elective surgeries that are generate far more revenue than uh, you know the, the 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 typical kinds of emergency services at the hospital. Our, our financial uh, uh, leadership absolutely worries about all of that. I, I, at the end of the day, we we always want to do the right thing uh, for for the community we serve. 
and um, you know having to choose and and defer and delay care it, it's a real challenge and it's it's something that we hope we don't have to uh, but the reality is if, if things get crazy again like it did last uh, turn of the year around December January we may need to look at that again Mark and Marina Del Rey emailed us at at comments at kpcc.org. What has changed in emergency rooms to protect non-COVID patients from COVID? Uh, and uh, which of those will end up as permanent changes after the pandemic? Well, emergency departments across the country, um, you know, uh, a lot of the same uh, screening continues to take place in terms of you know, uh, uh, finding out what's going on with the patient, the risk for infection. Certainly, if somebody comes in with active pulmonary symptoms, um, depending on the hospital system and their capacity, they're going to be triaged to different areas. And uh, different hospitals are creating different paradigms to try to ma- manage these cases. You know, many hospitals, including ours, for example, now have physicians in the triage area so that if a patient comes in, we may see them in our outer areas. If, if they need a quick assessment, we'll try to assess them and send them home. If they're more critically ill, obviously they'll need a bed. Um, the, pro- the protocols are still in place across the country around managing COVID versus non-COVID cases. And all hospitals are doing their very best to try to manage all of this extra demand that's happening. Um, and uh, uh, so it, it's not going to be a, a great time to be a patient in the upcoming months. But the medical system is is stretched and is doing its very best to to meet community's needs. Karina in Los Angeles emailed us a week ago. There were some reports of kids under two being hospitalized at higher rates because of Omicron. I haven't seen any follow up. Has that held? Yeah, Karina, uh, we have not seen any follow up yet. And again, this has to do with the fact that the data is just so early with Omicron and how it's coming out of of South Africa. I I completely agree. I think in the next couple of weeks, we'll have a lot more data. Uh, Unfortunately, as Omicron spreads, there'll be more information about how this behaves in children, adults, those that are vaccinated, those that are partially vaccinated. Tamanika uh, emailed us, uh, Pasadena's had its first um, uh, case of Omicron, and it was reported to be someone who is vaccinated and boosted. Uh, Tamanika says there doesn't seem to be any protection short of isolation. What is the doctor's advice on how to stay safe now? Well, Dominique, you you bring up a a wonderful point um, with this uh, variant uh, evading a lot of, uh, uh, of what we have in terms of tools um, some of the tools may turn into, you know, things like masks and, you know, California just extended its mandate, similar to what's happening in Los Angeles. And it may be for, for people to just be a, a far more aware and cautious, like the last time we spoke about this in terms of who they're gathering with and what type of protection they may have. Um, to some extent, we know that even with fully vaccinated and boosted individuals, even with Delta, there was some infections that were going to continue to occur. So uh, we just need to do our best. Uh, At this point, we we don't have 100% protection. So much of our activities become those that we need to be more aware of, uh, hand washing, maintaining a little bit of distance. And if we can, trying to gather and have our close activities with better aeration, such as outdoor activities, if that's possible. I have to say for myself, Dr. Torbati, that, you know, with Omicron and it's apparently, uh, you know, much greater transmissibility than than Delta, you know, my my sense is now that, you know, there's a good chance I'm not going to avoid getting it, even though I'm fully vaccinated, I'm boosted, I wear masks, I'm cautious where I go. I just figure, you know, with Omicron, there is there's a much greater chance I am going to get it. But, you know, give in the, I went and looked at this, the Pasadena person that Tamanika mentioned, and that person had mild COVID. And generally, it appears that's going to be the case for the greater number of people who end up getting the Omicron variant of COVID. So, you know, I'm working through kind of making my peace with the fact, despite I may do everything without locking myself in my house 24-7, that there's a better chance I'm going to get it. But 
I'm likely not going to end up in the hospital. And, you know, it's all managing risk. And I guess at this point, I feel like I, I, I've just got to kind of come to terms with that. Yeah. And Larry, the, the other thing to keep in mind is that, you know, getting a mild case of, you know, COVID, the, you know, if it turns out to be Omicron, is not, is not terrible as long as you don't get very sick. And the what we should focus is the fact that although vaccines may not prevent um, COVID uh, infection, especially with Omicron, they, they do have a significant effect in terms of preventing severe disease. So, um, you know, I, I want to make sure that the listeners stay focused on the importance of being vaccinated, encouraging others to get vaccinated, get the booster. And if you do that, the likelihood of Omicron or subsequent variants uh, causing severe disease goes way, way down. And so yeah. it turns out to come through as a little bit of a, you know, runny nose and a sore throat and a little bit of body ache, then great. We'll take it. Yeah, I, I guess that's my, you know, it's all, we've talked about this before when you've been on, it's really all risk-reward management. And we all kind of have to, de- you know, to what extent are we willing to accept risk for things that we want to do? And um, and then, you know, just how important is any given thing that we do that we take on some degree of risk to do it? And, you know, that that's all I can think to do as, as we go through this, because the idea that somehow you're going to absolutely guarantee you don't get COVID-19, uh, what that would actually require of us to do would be so extreme. I don't think most of us could live with that. No, no, no one's willing to shut shut down again and, and stop living. We, we need to figure out how to live with this and use all of the tools available to us. And right now, you know, our most powerful tools are, you know, vaccination, boosters, and in certain environments, masking. We're talking with Dr. Sam Torbati of Cedar Sana Medical Center. He's an emergency medicine specialist. Uh, Renaldo tweets at AirTalk, can you get Delta and Omicron uh, one right after the other? Is that possible or even simultaneously? It's a great question, Renaldo. We, uh, we're not sure. Um, this is so new. The cases have not come up. But interestingly enough, I did see a patient yesterday who had simultaneous COVID and influenza. Mm, wow. So uh, I obviously identical symptoms of both cough, fever, congestion. So, uh, you know, the presence of uh, multiple viral infections presenting during cold and flu season is a real question. Uh, I think they, uh, you know, time will tell how this pans out. Uh, Robin and Burbank wondering what we can do to boost our immune systems against COVID-19. Are there things we can eat or exercises we can do? Robin, the best advice is is for people to take care of themselves as you would uh, during any other uh, time period. Make sure you you get adequate sleep, that you, your nutritional status is good. Uh, if people don't eat fruits and vegetables, a multivitamin is a great idea. But the studies didn't show that taking extra medications in terms of vitamin C or D or zinc really had a big outcome change. So it's just general precautions the way you would in terms of taking care of yourself during any time of the year and avoiding things that aren't good for you. You know, please don't smoke. Um, Those are just uh, common things that anybody and everybody can do. Kathy in Burbank says, I'm curious how they determine how many COVID cases are actually Omicron. What percentage of tests are being checked for the Omicron variant? So, Kathy, the uh, the, the testing is not done at the level of, say, hospitals or health systems. Uh, there's specific labs that can do this genomic sequencing, and that data comes through sampling. And so uh, as time goes on, you'll hear more and more from the CDC as they report the, uh, the presence of, of Omicron cropping in different parts of the country. California, for example, has a pretty extensive surveillance system in place to, you know, to, to monitor for different variants. And so more data will, will come up as, time, as, as we get further into the cold and flu season.
Danny and La Habra emailed us at atcomments at kpcc.org. Uh, I've heard many people say COVID-19 uh, received that label because there were 18 previous COVIDs. It's my understanding the moniker refers to the year the virus was identified, not the number of previous COVIDs. Uh, how do I respond to someone who says that? Um. So the, the, the illness is similar to, you know, influenza, right? We, if you get a influenza from year to year, it's still influenza. It's still the same virus. And so different strains will come and go. But we're going to be calling the, um, the illness the, the same thing. It's going to be a COVID-19 infection. Um, and, uh, and so uh, I, I wouldn't let that be a barrier. It's it's still the same virus. It's just different variants that are potentially coming through that are causing disease. With influenza, for example, there's dis- different strains that come through every year. We still call it influenza. Yeah, and COVID-19 was uh, was discovered in 2019. So it is it is the year that's that what the number represents, right, doctor? That is correct. Yeah. So COVID-19 is because December of 2019, it was first discovered in Wuhan, China. Had it been a month later, we'd be calling it COVID-20. Uh, you're correct. Corona, coronavirus, uh, coronavirus 19. That's correct. All right. Uh, 866-893-KPECC. If you have any additional questions before we break in our conversation with Dr. Uh, Torbati, and Ann in View Park says, I understand that sneezing and coughing are particularly dangerous ways for spreading the virus, but rather regular breathing. Uh, how much does that aerosolize the droplets? Um, regular breathing um, is associated with some movement. Of, of droplets is certainly much less than coughing or sneezing. So, um, you know, if, if someone's coughing or sneezing, the likelihood of them uh, spreading and aerosolizing goes way up. All right. Uh, let's see. James in Santa Barbara is vaccinated in early April, contracted the Delta variant at the end of August. And I want to find out uh, how soon can I get the booster, because I keep hearing uh, if you've had the virus, you should postpone the booster a few more months than usual. What do you think? Yeah, the general guidelines are that after a native infection, you should have adequate antibodies for up to 90 days. But having said that, you certainly qualify. If you wanted to get a booster, you could. It's, it's really up to you. And Scott and Torrance, have there been studies done looking at a certain amount of our mRNA vaccines within a certain time period, what might be too much or unsafe? My family and I are fully vaccinated and boosted, but we're hearing about the possibility of fourth doses in Israel. And Scott says, I'm just concerned about, you know, if I have to get four shots in a year. Yeah, we, we don't have that data. And, and Scott, as you know, um, you know, the two mRNA vi- of our, uh, vaccines that we have currently actually have different amounts of vaccine um, with the Moderna providing a higher load than the Pfizer. So far, we don't have any data to suggest that they're harmful in any way or that stacking and having multiple do any harm at all other than boosting your immunity. So, so far, the data is very supportive of boosting as as the method of of protection Um, and more information will become available but so far so good thank you dr torbati we so appreciate your joining us today it's a real pleasure and we'll look forward to uh, having you with us again soon wonderful great to talk to you Thanks for listening to this episode of COVID in L.A. If you'd like to stay up to date with the latest coronavirus news, you can listen anytime at LAist.com, at kpcc.org, or subscribe wherever you download podcasts. See you next time and stay safe. I'm Larry Mantle.